For Krumah Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Madiba. Political analyst Dr. Ralph Mateja joins me to unpack his book titled The ANC's Last Decade, How the Decline of the Party Will Transform South Africa. Why do you predict that the African National Congress will lose its grip on power, if not in the 2024 elections, then in 2019? I think that uh, if you look at uh, where the ANC is and how far it has gone, they're now going into closing in on the third decade of democracy. I mean, in the next uh, elections, uh, the ANC would have been 30 years in power. And there is a, a nearly irrefutable observation that uh, liberation parties such as the ANC, you are ZANU PF, uh, you are Frelimo, uh, and so forth, Renamo. Uh, those liberation parties with, that come from that tradition usually they stay in power for. 30 years, uh, after 30 years, they tend to resort to other means to be able to stay in power, usually clamping down on the opposition and just rigging the system to stay in power, no longer having or enjoying that popular uh, majority. And if you look around, that's what you're seeing across the north. You're seeing that in Zimbabwe, that the ZANU PF has to resort to other means to stay in power. So you are seeing the same thing in Mozambique, of course. A lot is said about Botswana's democracy, but uh, I have my own doubt, not necessarily competitive, if you like. Where they govern democratically after 30 years, they start to run into trouble. Look at where the NC is. It's headed to that 50% mark, the biggest push in the previous elections, uh, taking the party down 60% in the 50s. Quite a remarkable, I, I would say, movement. And I think the NC is headed there, in all character, is headed there. And if the ANC slips below 50% at the polls, so do you think South Africa is ready for coalition government? And will this coalition government improve democracy and save its delivery? Look, coalitions send a very strong message. For them to function efficiently depends on a lot of things. It depends on the political culture of the society. It depends on the strength of the institutions. And I think we might have challenges in this regard. But I'll tell you, looking at the crisis, we are faced with where a strong party with the mandate such as the ANC has misgoverned in the way that it did. I mean, massive corruption in the public service, inefficiency, the whole mess. There's no other way of putting it. Looking at that, you then get to understand that even if coalition government will be unstable, at least the fact that the decision will lie with two or three parties when it comes to even spending money, at least that puts on top some layer of accountability that I think has been required. So they may be inefficient in a, in a, in a short run. I mean, we've seen what happened in Tuani, city of Johannesburg, Nelson Mandela Bay, very unstable government there. But I think that we can also agree that during that time that even we had that unstable coalition, at least misuse of funds declined during that time because the responsibility was not just with the single party. In the long term, coalition function, but you need to work on that. And why do you argue that the ANC was a great liberation movement, but a poor governing party? As a driver of the liberation movement, uh, as a driver of the liberation in South Africa, the ANC had it all. I mean, the, the ANC led the society while in exile. They were hardly here, uh, visibly, after being banned, but they were able to exert influence. They had that moral rectitude to do this thing, and they've had international solidarity with countries across the world, uh, sanctions being called against apartheid government to a point where it became untenable. So they did very, very well. And even remarkably, it's the transition that went about in South Africa, bloodless to a relative extent. Of course, there are people who lost their lives, but we did not get into an outright civil war. So they did a good job. But as a governing party, you go look for yourself out there. It shows the struggle to be a governing party. And do you think the ANC could have better heeded the history of other liberation parties and avoided pitfalls of democratic centralism and non-accountability? The story of the ZANU-PF, it, it, it's just right here. You don't need to travel far to get a case as to what happens when a party starts to close ranks on dissent, when a party is captured by a few elite, when a party whose internal leadership exchange recently was not determined by a conference, really. I mean, Mr. Mnangagwa came through military coup. So if you look at the optics in Zimbabwe, we have a very, very strong case showing us what happened. What happens actually if we start doing things that happened in, in Zimbabwe? 
We have many cases far. Countries in the West Africa are even much more, more serious cases, extreme versions of uh, uh, what you could see. I thought that the ANC maybe should have said we are going to do it different. We are a popular party, but we are going to try to democratize. We will deliberately democratize to a point of discomfort. And in well-functioning democracy, cabinet appointments are based on merit rather than factionalism. Recently, President Cyril Ramaphosa announced 10 new ministers to his cabinet, including in the key health and finance portfolios. What is your view on these appointments? This is quite a controversial uh, issue here because we know that politicians are politicians. They don't go to school for it. So they get hired to a portfolio because they can put stakeholders together. I think the merit of a politician is having a basic understanding of the sector so that you don't read wrong speeches, not knowing what you're doing there. And, and also most importantly as well, giving political leadership and certain accountability. You don't need to go to school for that. But in our case, the problem is that some of the ministers lack those basics. Hence, they end up being embroiled in corruption. Some of the things that happened allegedly at the Department of Health and uh, former minister Zelim Keys led into digital vibe contracts. I, mean, I don't even call that corruption. It, it's so at, in your face, but it, it, it's more than that. But looking at that, looking at what it actually means, it actually says that uh, in our society, we don't have ministers who at times are familiar with the basics of their portfolio. Sometimes you have people who go there just to get involved in scandals and it's not okay at all. And, and I think it, it has become the culture in the public service that we, we cannot talk about merit in strict terms. But now that there's a performance agreement, probably it will be implemented where ministers at least can be held to some substantive performance. Corruption undermines the capacity of state to deliver service delivery to its citizens. Why has ANC's disciplinary processes been so ineffective in dealing with corruption? With the force standing aside of ACE Mahashule, are things now improving in this regard? I think that it's been difficult, particularly implementation of the step aside rule. Uh, there's been party resistance to that. And, and, and President Ramaphosa has been championing that. But the big problem is that he doesn't want that to be seen as a political maneuver against his detractors within the ANC. But things have worked well because if you are trying to politically undermine people who are morally undermined, it's not that much of work. I mean, you can say what you say. The reality is that it's easy to take a battle to Mahashile because he, he does seem to have allegations of impropriety to, to answer to. And I think that's how Ramaphosa is surviving on this one. Depending on state institutions to push their work and him activating step aside rule, getting the NEC to rally against him, I've seen the NEC rallying against him recently in a way that is very interesting, showing that the tide seems to be quite, quite shifting. And what does the recent violence and unrest say about the risk posed by factionalism in the ANC? Do you predict more such stabilization in future? Oh, well, I don't predict such on a massive scale because there were genuine failures to prevent what had happened. I mean, genuine failures on the side of the security and so forth. And I think they were genuine. I don't think there were sinister motives behind anything. I think, however, that uh, as far as the NC factions are concerned, this actually reveals a very bitter, bitter picture that when the NC dysfunctions, the society will dysfunction. Remember, this thing comes from within the NC relating to Zuma, the support of Zuma. Now, NC members interfere with the functioning of state institution when uh, Zuma had to be arrested. So the thin line, the party should be far from the state, when the party saving problems should end within the party, not affect the state institution. But in this case, it's an uncomfortable space where one sees the NC being almost very, very close to state institution. And you argue there is a disconnection between the ANC's support at the ballot box and its image in public. Please unpack this vexing contradiction. Well, the thing is that you see all the criticisms against the NC in the public, people angry, talk to people. But go check at the ballot box. I mean, even looking at the recent by-elections in local government elections, I'm not just looking at a single issue. There's been a series of elections that I discussed with journalists. The NC keeps on retaining what? Despite poor performance. So you look at the party in terms of the public reputation, in terms of how it's viewed in government generally, it's a poor performer. But go to the polls. They don't lose. I don't know whether this has to do with the weak opposition or what, but they don't lose. 
That was Dr. Ralph Mateja speaking to Crema Media's polity about the ANC's last decade.